All right, so this is project four, right? Project four for typography, spring 2016. And we are uh, going to create a new document in InDesign, not facing pages, so check that off. Make sure that's unchecked. This is a print document. Now this page size is going to be a, a custom page size. Uh, it's not going to be letter, but we're going to go ahead and type in the numbers. It's 10 inches by 10 inches, which would be 60 picas by 60 picas. So make sure it says 60 pica by 60 pica, assuming you've used the 10 in to type in for your width and height. For this, this is going to be freestyle. So um, I'm going to leave my column at 1. And I'm going to go ahead and leave my margins at a half an inch, which is equal to three picas. So I'm not too worried about um, margins, or I'm not too worried about columns right now, the grid. Because in the book, it doesn't really mention much about that. Now, if I hit the preview button, it'll show me uh, one page with a pink line. The pink line is not the edge of the page, it's just the, mar the thumb space. The edge of the page actually goes all the way to the gray. So this looks pretty good. So this is a 10 inch by 10 inch document or 60 pica by 60 pica and one column and the margins are half an inch. Nothing too major yet. I hit OK. Get my workspace ready here. Now it really doesn't show any use of color in the examples here so I would say let's let's focus on using mainly black and white on this, okay? You let the type speak for for it, not necessarily color. So we have this paragraph, and we would be typesetting this paragraph in Microsoft Word. Um, and I unfortunately don't believe I have the paragraph set for you. That would be nice if I had. I'm looking on Blackboard. I don't think it's there. Nope. If it were, it would be a a, a link. So we all need to take a couple seconds to typeset in Word. The par five paragraphs on uh, Gutenberg. Now you could also do this if you're like, oh, I don't want to typeset, guys. I'm just, I'm not trying to encourage laziness, but maybe I go to the internet and I try to find something I'm interested in, such as an article about mon monkeys. I used to have monkeys as pets, so this is why I'm interested. Yes, I did. I had two monkeys as pets. Uh, my mom could no longer have children. She had her tubes tied after my last sister was born, her fourth child, so we had plenty of kids running around. And at one point she felt like she needed to have another child, but um, she really couldn't. So she um, and my stepfather decided, why not a monkey? Um, <laughs> because monkeys kind of look like little kids, little people, I guess, I don't know. But it was, it was, so I had a monkey sister and a monkey brother, and those were my real siblings. Then my parents got monkeys. No. <laughs> now we had two monkeys. I'll show you what they looked like here in just a second. They were what they call uh, capuchin. Some people call them capuchins, but they were organ grinder monkeys. And we had two of them. So these are what they look like. One looked like this, with the white face, and one was a silver face, which um, looked more like this, only not quite as mad most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so these two were from two different regions of South America. Uh, oh, there's a lady who had a monkey bite, probably. Um, <laughs> they bite. Uh, I still have scars. Uh, yeah, fabulous. But my parents left these two monkeys in two different cages. We had Mickey first, which was this one. She looked a lot like this. That looks like a sad monkey. So Mickey had her own big apartment in the garage. And Chico came because we found him through, I think, the Thrifty Nickel or some crap. And um, the trader. Somebody was getting rid of him. And in the 70s, this happened in the 70s. In the 70s, uh, you could freely buy monkeys. It was weird. It was before they started to pass a lot of laws that said, hey, this shouldn't be happening. Um, so this was before the laws were passed. So you could get monkeys. There, there is a big trade in monkeys. Um, and so my, the other monkey, Chico, who looked, you know, more uh, silver-faced, he wasn't as pretty. Um, they put usually the white-faced ones here. But our silver-faced Chico, I'll, I'll say this monkey, he's not as pretty. We had him in his own cage. And um, they thought that they would breed the monkeys. And my parents were kind of ignorant about monkeys. 
And you can't take two different monkeys that are different colors and put them together. Because in the wild, they actually, all the monkeys of one color range, they all hang together. And the other monkeys of a different color range, they hang together. They're called subspecies. And when one of those guys crosses the boundary into the other, they oftentimes kill them or run them off or kill them. So my parents put them together, and that didn't work out very well. They did not have babies. And Mickey usually looked like this when she was looking at Chico. She didn't want anything to do with him. And, and she would beat him up unless she was cold. And uh, then she let him huddle next to her. And Chico, uh, we went to go to the grocery store one morning, and we came back, and Chico was dead. And we assumed, well, he, he choked on a piece of lettuce, and we assumed that poor Chico, that looks like Chico, we assumed that Mickey had shoved it down his throat in cover-up for her killing him. So, yeah. So we, then we had just Mickey. Now, Mickey went to a pet store when my parents got a divorce and mom couldn't take care of her. And I ended up working at that same pet store when I came into Indianapolis. Um, and I didn't know she was there. So that was kind of cool. So I was reunited with Mickey the monkey when I was 19 years old, 18 years old. And we were friends then till 2000 or until 1992. I got to stay there. Till, I worked there till 1992. Okay, so I'm going to create a new document in Word, and it's not really wanting to s cooperate with me, so I'm trying to get it to. You know, Word, okay, so last night I was reading a label, and it would, like, my whole, my, my whole computer shut down. And, like, everything would come up in this big window, and it would be like, basically nothing worked on your computer, even Microsoft Word. Uh. So then I was like, well, that's nice. And then, so this morning when I came in to redo it in Word, I, just, you know, I had the same thing. Like, I got the mm. app to look best, and, and no, no good, no good. Yeah, we're, uh, Microsoft products on Mac are a little, little, little bit more challenging. I got it to work though. Now, if you do copy and paste something from the internet, like I am, you do not want all the formatting. I don't need the pic. Oh my, he's gorgeous. I don't need the pictures of all of these things. So I need to strip out the formatting and get rid of all the pictures. Okay. So let me um, show you how to do that because most of you guys have maybe not had to do this before. Um, my word looks so different than uh, what I'm used to here. Let me poke around and see if I can figure something out. Okay, there, that looks good. Okay, so I'm in Word and I pasted this thing about chimpanzees. I'm looking for what are called uh, uh, styles, uh, you know, like that's a Heather and that's a body copy. And in the Mac, over here in the um, far right, upper right area, there's a little arrow, very quiet little guy next to the smiley face. And I'm expanding that ribbon. This is going to bring up my styles pane, or my styles here. And I can bring up the styles pane by clicking on this little backwards P. That's what I want there. I want to see this. I want to be able to click on clear formatting, basically. So if I'm going to clear the formatting from anything I've taken from the internet, I select all, and I hit clear formatting. And that'll get rid of any styles. And then I'm going to go in and delete these photographs because... Um, well, I don't need them. I might put a little extra return between chan. I'm going to actually, for chimp chimpanzee life, I'm going to get rid of all of these subheads, like chimpanzee life uh, and so on. So I'm just getting rid of stuff. Oh, baby chimp. Very cute. And all I need is five paragraphs. So this is probably more than what I need. Anybody seen the orangutan exhibit at the, uh, at the, uh, Zoo yet? Is it pretty good? I haven't been yet. I heard it was really good. Okay. Now, I am going to count how many paragraphs I have. I have one, two, three. Oh, there's a little one. Four, five. Okay, so I'm just getting rid of all but five paragraphs. That's a lot of paragraphs there. Yes, Dom. Um, you, I suppose you could, um, yeah, he asked, could you use the lorem ipsum generator? I suppose this is an assignment where you could do that and get away with it, yeah. This, I mean, some of these have a headline and some don't, so I, I guess it doesn't matter if it has a headline or does not. Headline is not a paragraph anyway, it's its own thing. Okay, so I need to save this. I'm going to go file, save as. And I'm going to, now if that's not in existence, um, 
Let's see, I know there was some weird stuff going on with Word. You can hit the Save button here. And if, um, trying to find what this would look like. If it comes up and you can't find your desktop in Word like this, like where, where am I saving it to? You have no idea. Click on my Mac right here. So this is new this semester with Word. It's, it's a little less easy to use. We have to dig for stuff. So when I click on my Mac, it will show, um, it may not be expanded out, maybe a small window like this, but when I click on this little arrow next to the name, I can tell it to save it to maybe my desktop. I'm gonna create a new folder and call it Project 4, and that's where I'm gonna park it. Create the folder by hitting the new folder button, name it, and then I'm gonna say chimpanzee text. There we go. So I'm getting a little bit bored, I guess, with this uh, printing in Germany body copy, and I'm going with chimpanzees because, well, why not? Okay, so this has been stripped of all of the formatting. I had it click, I had clicked on clear formatting. And again, let me review that. That was under, um, you, to find that in Word, you had to click on the little arrow in the control panel at the top. It says expand ribbon. And then you had to click on the styles pane to get that to open. You select everything, which is command A on a Mac, control A on a PC, and click the clear formatting button. Okay. And then save it. Okay. Goodbye, monkeys. Now, I'm going to bring this text in. I should create, five, by the way, I need to create five pages for this document. I probably should have done that when I opened it, uh, but I had not. I'd forgotten. So I've already created this document. So I'm going to quickly add five pages. Uh, the, one of the quickest ways to do it is to right click in the pages panel area, which is the gray space here. Right click, go to insert pages. And a window is going to come up when I after I right click here. And it's I want five pages. So right here where it says pages one, you want uh, four more pages because you already have one out there. So four pages after page one. There we go. I just right clicked in the pages panel and went insert pages. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to bring in this text. And you know what I'm probably going to do? I'll go ahead and put it in this page, but I may be copying and pasting from it. So I, you might see me move that out to the pasteboard. Uh, but let me go to File and Place to go get that text. Command V. Yes, Isaac. <clears throat> No, not on this because it's not a project and we won't be, uh, this probably will not, this won't end up in a portfolio. So in this case, no, I'm not worried about sourcing, but thank you. I appreciate, that's very professional of you to think of it and ask about it. But okay. since this won't be in a portfolio we're, and it's just for an exercise, I think we'll be okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to go to File and Place to get this text, which is Command D for those of us who are keyboard shortcut junkies. I know you're out there. I locate the folder that I uh, saved that uh, text document in. And then I find the actual text document, which is the Word document. And then I hit open. And I will, it'll tell me a font's missing because whatever font default was used in uh, Microsoft Word may not be loaded here. So I'm going to close that. And I'm just going to click. I'm not going to click and drag. I'm just going to click and that'll pop that right in there. Okay, this is just to get this text in here so I can start playing with it. One, two, three, four, five. I have six paragraphs, so I'm going to kill one of them. I wasn't counting very well. You only need five paragraphs. Any more than five and it starts to run into some problems of space.
oh, you had forgotten to tell it to, when you created a new document, if you have pages five by, side by side, you forgot to turn off facing pages right here. Now, you've already created the document, so how do you turn off facing pages after you've created the document? So go to layout, uh, or no, I'm sorry, go to file, document setup, and uncheck facing pages, okay? So for those of you guys who have something that looks like this, oops, is this what you're talking about, Sandra? Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is that little detail that we, oh, I forgot to turn off facing pages, so it acts like it's a book. So you don't have to start a new document. You just go to File, Document, Setup, and then uncheck facing pages, and it'll break them out into single pages. It's a really good question, and, and a lot of people would automatically close this and start again, but you don't have to waste that kind of time. You just need to know where to go. Okay. Now I have five paragraphs. Um, and basically, uh, this, the, the book talks about how you can kind of uh, separate paragraphs um, in one of the chapters here. But there, there's just so many different ways, so I'm going to try to do it a few different ways. Now, let's start simple. I'm going to, I'm not going to worry about the headline. I'm going to grab everything but the headline. This would be a click and drag. Make sure you get all the way to the end. Uh, if you have a headline, then... Uh, you would click and drag and get it. If you don't have a headline, you would do five clicks or Command A, and it'll grab all the text. But right now, I have a headline. I want to avoid doing anything with it. So I want to share with you the basics of paragraph settings and formattings. This is not this is not the fancy stuff, okay? But it's stuff you need to know. So let me zoom in a little bit. Now, paragraph formatting controls are found in the control panel at the top. You notice we have the A for character formatting. <coughs> That's for the font, and the point size, and leading, and some other things. Um, now, if I, I might go ahead and use Helvetica, but before I do, I probably should make sure I'm using the correct Helvetica. So let me go ahead and activate the fonts that I have here, and I'm going to use Helvetica New. Now, activation takes a second. I'm watching right here. When that's done going through, I'm going to go ahead and go back to InDesign. So uh, this is on the computers in the classroom. Your computer at home or your laptop, you won't have Suitcase Fusion more, more than likely, so you could just double click on the font name and, and tell it to install. But right now it's activating these typefaces or these fonts for me to use. And it's, Helvetica, is, Helvetica New takes quite a while because it's got over 20 different members of its family. So it's almost done. Okay, it's done with Helvetica. So Helvetica should be available. It's still doing Garamond. So I am going to, uh, well, it's still working. Give it a second. InDesign is waiting on, uh, was waiting on suitcases. Okay, so I will change this font to Helvetica New because it is a professional uh, font. It's one we provide uh, versus the Helvetica that came with the system. So I'm going to find Helvetica New, and I'll right now just do regular, okay, keep it simple. Maybe for the headline, I'll go ahead and do a pretty bold one just so I can separate that out. Okay, so one of the most, what's one of the most common ways you guys see a paragraph, the, the indication that a paragraph is starting? An indention. Here's what you don't do. Pay real close attention because this is what you do do. I'm going to put my cursor in here, and I'm going to hit the tab key. Okay, that's that one. Here's this one. Oh, gosh, where's the next one? I don't know. I can't tell if that's the end. This is the beginning. I know this is one. I'm like, I don't know. I know I had five paragraphs here, but it only looks like I, oh, here's another one. Okay, there's that. So I'm missing one in here somewhere. This is not the way you do it, even though that's what you've been trained to do. Okay? You've been trained as if the computer is a typewriter. You guys ever seen a typewriter? Yeah. In the typewriter, we have to do hit the tab key for that. On a computer, we do not. All right? So stop that bad habit. Here's what we do on a computer. In the paragraph formatting control panel, which is the backwards P, you can set a first line indent using one of these things up here. We just have to figure out which one it is. If 
I float my cursor over this, it says left indent. Well, that's going to be the whole paragraph. Let me try it. Oh, yeah, it's indenting the whole thing. Oh, well, that's not it. Sometimes we learn by trying, don't we? Like, oh, that's not what I wanted. This one right here says, oh, first line indent. Oh, that's it. That's what we said. It's the indention of the first line. Well, let me put that in there. Oh, look at that. They're all doing it. I don't even, I don't have to guess which one was a paragraph and which wasn't. Between the second and third paragraph, I couldn't tell where that ended and where the other one began. Now I can. So this is a first line indent. Well, and, and if you hit the tab key, it's got too much space. So a first line indent of a pica usually is pretty good. That's so easy, isn't it? Dom's over here like going, I wish I would have known this beforehand. He's hit the space bar three times or the tab to get every paragraph ended on the stuff he's been working on for his clients. Dom is working harder, not smarter. This is why he pays for school, so he can get smart. <laughs> okay, so there's one, this is just the simplest way to indicate a paragraph that you're normally going to see uh, in any publication. Now, there are other ways. Sometimes we have no left indent. Can anybody name another way that I could indicate where one paragraph begins and the other one ends? Space, space, between, space the between the paragraphs, yeah. Well, let's see what we have here. Well, here's one that says space after the paragraph. Okay, well, I'm going to see what happens when I push the button. Oh, looky there. You should not hit return to get the spaces between the paragraphs. In other words, a double return. That is actually bad habit. Before today, it was the right thing to do. But you want to use the space after paragraph option. There's also a space before paragraph. Sometimes, sometimes I'll use one and I'll go, oops, I should have used the other. And the only way I know which one to use is by uh, kind of a little bit of experience. So this is, uh, it, it could be one pocket. Let me give you a little secret. Uh, let me set this typeface at 12 over 14 because I don't want it to be auto letting. The secret is the space after the paragraph is usually the same number as your letting amount. If it because you want it to look like a double return. Well, the space between par the space that that a line takes up is 14. In my case, I have 12 point Helvetica over 14 points of letting. I know you can't see that from back there very far, but I have 12 over 14. So use the same number for your letting as you do for your space after. So this is going to be P14, not 14P, because it's in, in, a, in a points. That converted to one pica with two points left over. So this space between the paragraphs is exactly the right number that we need. You're like, well, why do we care? Well, watch this. Here's why we care. If I have another column and it comes over like so and I line these up, these will close line across their baselines, so now you can get it lined up well. These close line across their baselines, no matter where I pull a guide down, the baselines match up there, up here, there, and so on. This is why we use the same amount, the number used for letting, you use the space after. So when we have a multiple column layout, everything close lines really nicely. They line up, their baselines line up. Okay? So that's why we use the same number for the letting as we do the space after. Oh my gosh, I see hyphens everywhere. Do you think I should kill hyphens on every project for, for typography class? Yeah, I mentioned that uh, a while back. Always kill your hyphens. Make sure that's done on your stuff. Always kill your hyphens. You get marked down if you don't. All right. So we did a space after paragraph. Again, the tip is that there typically is use the same number is the letting. What's another way we might be able to uh, indicate the beginning or the end of a paragraph? I'm going to take out the space. That was the second way. How else might I be able to tell if par where a paragraph begins? So we had an indent. We had space after. Those are pretty common, aren't they? Let's talk about some of the more uncommon things. Symbol at the end, usually, yes. You, I got the idea. She's like, use an ending paragraph symbol. 
Now, what we do is these will run all together. So, I, but I have to get, find the end of a paragraph. Now, to find the end of the paragraph, uh, this can be tough, especially for me between the second and third paragraph. So for me to make sure I'm doing this properly, I might go to type and at the very bottom, show hidden characters. This lets me know where one paragraph starts and another one ends. When you see a backwards P at the end, that's the end of a paragraph. Okay, so there's that. Now if you see a little L there because you grab something from the internet, maybe you see this. Excuse me. If you see a, a sideways L like this, that is not a paragraph return. That's actually what's called a soft return. So sometimes when I copy stuff from the internet, I paste it in Word. When my paragraphs are separated, I see this at the end, assuming you're showing your hidden characters. Well, if you see those, zoom into them so you can see them a little bit better, highlight them. They're invisible characters, but you can't see them as long as you went to type and show hidden characters. And just hit the return key so you replace the uh, soft return with a real return. Now, what is a soft return good for? Uh, that's a good question. I use them occasionally um, when I want to start a new line but not a new paragraph. So. For, um, the, in this case, let's say I wanted all of my paragraph to line up at this point all the way down. Okay, so where my cursor is, all the way down. So I'm going to hit command uh, uh, backslash, not forward slash. This is up near the delete key. What? How did you do that? What? I would have taken days to have that set. I know, it's crazy. Well, if I hit the return key on something like this, it's going to create a new paragraph. I don't want it to create a new paragraph. I just want to move that down to the next line. So a soft return, which is shift return, moves it down to the next line without creating a new paragraph. These are really kind of weird little details that are actually really important when you're setting, uh, when you're working with, with text. Okay, so a hard return is just hitting return. And a soft return is hitting, sh is holding down shift and then hitting return. That's a soft return moving things to the next line without starting a new paragraph. And by the way, that is the align here command. The thing I did here, it looks like a little, a little cross right here now, or a dagger. That wasn't there before. So that invisible character, let me get rid of it. When it's gone, nothing aligns there to that point where I have my cursor. But again, if I held down uh, Command and the backslash, which is underneath the Delete key, there you go. That's the Align Here command. Okay. I'm covering quite a bit. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you have triangles. Do you have triangles in here and you're invisibles? Oh, I don't know. Oh, like this? Yeah. I think they might have been some special character quote. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think Float Nowhere gives me a whole lot of answer here. It's got empty. If you have triangles, just delete that and hit the space bar, okay? Not sure exactly what they indicate. And it might have been that they were using a these sort of, it might have been dumb quotes instead of smart quotes and they didn't translate well. So it was probably something along the lines of uh, some information that had a special quotation around it. And unfortunately I've closed that page so I don't have that to compare to. So it may have been some sort of special character. We'd have to reference where you got it from. By the way, I'm zooming in and out by hitting Command-0 to zoom to the full page. Command-0 makes it 100% within the screen that you're in. Or not 100%, it just zooms it out to fit the screen. Okay, now, Alicia said a special character. So I'm going to put a special character, which is a paragraph ending mark, and you can choose anything you want that's in the font glyphs. Now, these are cool. Font glyphs are so awesome. They're little characters that are part of this typeface, but you didn't know existed. So I'm hitting the space bar one time because I want to give a little space between... This is the end of this paragraph. 
the end of the paragraph and this little glyph. So my cursor is in there. I'm in with the type tool. And I'm going to go to type, and about seven items down is glyphs. And you'll get this glyphs panel that comes up. Holy cow! Look at all these crazy glyphs. I got registered trademark symbol, the copyright symbol. I got, I have uh, fractions and all sorts of stuff. Oh, I have even a backwards paragraph, or I have a paragraph symbol. I don't want that though. I want something prettier. You can scroll down the glyphs panel and you might be able to find some more awesome glyphs. Okay. Mm, this one doesn't have really super awesome ones. Sometimes there's a uh, flower. Okay, smiley face. There we go. That's the end of the paragraph. And I double click on it, and when I double click on it, it automatically puts it in there. Oh, cool. I'm going to close the glyphs panel. Now I just go between paragraphs and I delete the paragraph return and hit the space bar to give it a little space. This tells me that this is where one paragraph ends and the next one begins. So it's kind of like it runs on and on. So I'm going to do this for all of them. So I'm going to. I'll just copy this glyph. I don't want to go to glyphs again. I'll copy it, I'll paste it, and I'll delete the extra return. So I'm just pasting that in there between paragraphs. Now, this does, to me, um, it, it does kind of um, look a little heavy for the reader. I tend to want to try to make things look a little bit more inviting for the reader. Even if I elongate this, you know, and try to make it not look so hard to read, you know, that, that's a lot of text. So I like to, you know, this is a fun way to do it if you know you're forced into saving some space. Maybe you're doing a novel or something and you, you're trying to save more pages of paper so it's cheaper. This would be a great way to do that because you have no spaces for the paragraphs at all. This is a really good, efficient way to indicate a paragraph has started. Usually we don't use smiley faces. We'll use something um, a little bit more uh, decorative, a little bit more typographically decorate, decorative. Helvetica, however, doesn't have the best sort of stuff. Let's, let's find Garamond, and Garamond may have better glyphs. Um, now, you'll notice that these glyphs have now turned into little X boxes. Not the game, sorry but boxes with X's in them, that means that character didn't, that little smiley face character does not exist for Garamond. So it goes, it puts pink behind it and a, and a box with an X. It goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Garamond is certainly not about smiley faces. We are not quite that fun. So you highlight that guy and you go to type and go to glyphs and then find what kind of glyphs that Garamond has. Every font, they're different. Ooh, that one's pretty. Or that one's pretty. Ooh, I like that. Or this one. I like the little clover. I just so I can replace that paragraph mark with the clover leaf. Okay. So I'm going to go in there and replace those. So we should replace them each one. Sometimes. There is a find and replace, which is fabulous. So uh, if you're going through here, you're going, oh my god, I don't want to have to paste them five times. You can. Uh, what I do is I'll highlight this ugly little Xbox and I'll hit, I'll copy it, Command C. And I'll go to Edit, Find and Change. It used to be called Find and Replace. Now it's called Find Change. Find this, change it to that. Okay, so I'm going to hit Find Change. I'm going to find what? Okay, I'm going to paste in that little, oh look, it's a little smiley face. Okay, I don't know if you can see that way, that's a little smiley face. Let me get this little clover and copy it. And I'm going to change it to clover. Let me paste it in there. Oops. Command V. Oh, wow. It didn't come in as a clover. It came in as a three. Hmm. Let's see if it'll... Oh, I'm a little worried. It doesn't have anything about glyphs in here. But we'll see. So I'm going to tell it to... Um, hmm. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Oh, find this glyph. Okay. Woo. Woo. This is really good. Okay. Wow. I'm going to copy again. Woo. This is too much for me to have to go and type in Helvetica. I'm going to find the glyph here. Oh, no. I have to actually tell it. 
Oh, I have to choose Helvetica. Now this one takes me a little longer. So like Helvetica new, and I want this glyph right here, smiley face. Yeah, I have to, this takes me a little while. Darn it. I wish the other one would work. Where was smiley face? Now if you have 100 pages of this, this is worth the time. There, I want you in there. I'm going to change that with a Garamond Pro glyph. Let me get Garamond. And that was the really pretty little four-leaf clover. And I can say change all right here, and it will change all of these to, it will change anything with a smiley face to the pretty little um, thing. Oh, search is incomplete, zero replacements made. Find next. Oh, I can't find it. Ooh, this is really, oh, you know why I can't find it? Because this is no longer that little uh, Helvetica thing. So this is, I'm, I'm meeting a little bit of resistance with the software because I've changed all of this to Garamond and it doesn't recognize this as Helvetica anymore. Now if this were still set as Helvetica, it would work. So I'm going to go back here to text. And I'm going to see if it will take this. I doubt that it will give me a glyph, so I'm going to say change all. Oh, this, oh, mm, this is really a problem. So I've got a problem here where I'm like, okay, maybe I should have uh, picked the right font in the first place because it's really confused about these glyphs. <laughs> so the glyphs thing is not, it's not, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge, okay? So in this case, I will actually have to copy and paste. I don't like that. I like doing things automated. So I'm copied and now I'm pasting. Darn it. But my point is, is this looks a little bit more professional than the smiley face thing. It all just depends on um, what what type say what what type you're setting and who the audience is. Okay, so that was a paragraph indicator symbol, and it can be anything you want, as long as it's in a glyph panel. <clears throat> another way to indicate paragraphs. What are your thoughts? What's another way? I'm getting them back. I'm breaking out those glyphs, deleting them. Oh, well, why not just bullet point them? Yeah, we could do that. I don't typically bullet point uh, paragraphs. I'll bullet point, bullet point, and copy. But let's do talk about that since we're here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to type a bullet point in there. In other words, I don't have to put my cursor in here and go to type and go to glyphs and find the bullet point. Uh, you know, what's a bullet point? Is that it? You know, that's a dot. I don't know if it's a bullet point. Um, is maybe there's a different one. Oh, here's a circular one. Is that a bullet point? Well, it could be. Uh, how about that? Well, it looks the same as the other one. Uh, oh, here's another one. Well, that looks the same as the other one. You know, so I'm going through trying to find... Oh, here's a big fat bullet point. It's a chubby one. There's another one. So, you know, you could do it this way, but this is going to take a while. Okay? So I have all of these different things I found in the glyphs panel. But they're not necessarily uh, exactly what I want. Now, if you were to bullet point text, it's going to put a bullet there and it's going to make it kind of uh, run over nicely. So I'm going to select all of this text and I'm going to go to the backwards P, which is paragraph formatting controls. And there's a bullet point list right here. I can click there and it will automatically put a bullet point for every single one of those paragraphs. And it will set how far the indent in there is and everything. This is called a run over. It makes a text that runs over this first line a line to the previous line. Okay, so that's super quick and simple. Now that's not, again, that's not usually how we indicate paragraphs, but if you did need to set bullet points for a small list of objects, this is a, it's a good thing to know. You could also do numbers. You have to highlight them all though for it to affect all of them. Now in the, uh, in the Bible, if you got, I haven't looked at the Bible lately because I'm a heathen, uh, but in the Bible, you know, they have uh, verses and paragraphs and all that stuff. And this is... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but they have all these little numbers and stuff in the Bible. This is oftentimes how they do that as well. Okay. So we talked about bullet points and numbering them. All right. Now the book has some really crazy stuff. So I'm going to go into the book. The book has curling type, goes into like swirls. Uh, the book did have uh, this run on. It said, oh, well, you know... Let's go ahead and bold every first line or every first word or bold it and underline it. You know, you could do that. Bold and underline. Okay, let's bold it and let's underline it. Now, for 
Garamon, it's not as effective because it's uh, not got a really heavy bold, but if this were Helvetica, this might become a little bit more effective. So you have all these examples in the book, but that's, that's not too crazy, the bolding thing. Now, what it, let's talk about offsetting them, unconventional settings, but yet still readable. So here I have this, this long story, and I want to shorten this up so I can separate my paragraphs. Now, you don't necessarily want to copy and paste one paragraph and then another and separate them that way. Uh, that's not typically how we do it out in the real world. Sometimes we do, but not typical. So what I have here is I have all of my text, but I'm hiding most of it except for the first paragraph. How do I get the second paragraph to show if I want it to be in a different text box, but st yet still stay linked? Oh, yeah, the plus sign that says, hey, there's more text in here. If I click on it, it will reload the cursor. I can click and drag a box or just click and it'll create a box. But I'm clicking and dragging, and that's the box I want. Now I'm going to use the little window shade and pull that up. That's the bottom anchor point here until I get to the next paragraph. I'm going to set that right in there. Now I'm going to click on, eh, I want that to not be so, uh, I didn't want a widow. Widow text is uh, text excessively short lines at the end of a paragraph. I was pretty heavily widowed before. Now I'm going to click on the red box again. I'm going to get another paragraph. Oops. I'm going to kind of squeeze out the rest of the text I don't want. Well, I'm going to get kind of crazy with this. I'm going to set my paragraphs so that they are not only really staggered, but where one ends, the other one begins immediately. So there's not a whole lot of room there. Let me hit the W key and you'll see what this looks like. It almost looks like all one continuous paragraph, but technically I have my first paragraph here, my second paragraph here, my third paragraph there. Now my fourth paragraph, I might start out here. Shorten that up a little bit. And oh, there's a widow right there. Here is a widow. Oh, I'm so alone. <laughs> Help me. To kill widowed text, usually I will either shorten up the block or elongate it just to squeeze that out. And we call it killing your widow. And that sounds horrible, I know, but it's true. Oh, just wait to see what we do with orth orphans. It's horrible. It's true. As a typographic term, it's really real. Kill your widows, kill your orphans, kill them all. And it just sounds so horrible. But that's what we do. Okay. So this is kind of a funky way that I have separated my paragraphs. And it, it's created this kind of odd shape, too. I have paragraph one here, paragraph two here, paragraph three here, paragraph four there, and paragraph five. I can still select all of this text at one time and maybe make it uh, a different typeface or something. The only bad thing is typefaces are drawn thicker or thinner. If I were to make this Helvetica, I'm going to, oh, it, this is the hard part. It's like, oh, Helvetica is so much, look, it, it takes up so much more space than Garamon, especially the regular one. And then you go, Oh, look, all my paragraphs are all fouled up. That's because Helvetica physically takes up more space, even though it's the same point size. I'm still using 12-point type. But it physically, it's, it, it, you know, its middle part is much bigger than Garamond's middle part. So now if I, have, if I wanted Helvetica, I have to redo this whole thing because the, the reflow is crazy. So all fonts, even though I'm using a 12-point type with 14 points of letting, all fonts don't look 12 points that are 12 points. Helvetica looks larger because it has a big X height. I'm going to hit Command Z because I don't want to redo that. Now, I suppose you could argue it's really hard to tell where one paragraph starts and another one stops. Okay, well, I'll just offset them a little bit. So, I'll just offset them. And now we could argue that, hey, we're okay now. This is a little bit more clear. 
where one paragraph starts and the other one stops. Okay, so there's one. Now I'm going to go on to the next page. Um, I am going to paste all of this text into, I copied and pasted it into a box. So I'm going to play, continue to play with this text. Um, I might increase the letting. So on this, right now it's 12 point type and it's supposed to be 14 points of letting. But let me add double the point size. So it's 12 point type, let me do 24 points of letting. Woohoo, it's a party of letting. It's lots of letting. Now I'm going to break this into paragraphs as well. So I'm going to break it down. And I might do something like this. And I did this when I was in college, a setting, and it went over pretty well for that project that I did. But I took two paragraphs, and I wanted one to start at a certain place and the other to start in another. And I would do stuff like this, where you had to read this paragraph, and then you might have gotten a little lost there for a second if you're not careful. And then you, your new paragraph started right in here. So the letting amount being thicker I could afford to put two paragraphs within one space. But it's definitely where one, you can definitely tell, tell where one paragraph starts and another one begins. Uh, is it a little harder to read? Yeah, it is. Starts to get a little crowded in there. And they have a, it looks like a, maybe a couple of examples, uh, not quite so extreme here in the book. So on this one, they tighten things up a little bit. By the way, when you're using the when you're moving or changing boxes in type, you can't be on the type tool. You have to be on the air, black arrow tool, which is the selection tool. So they did something more along the lines of this, where they just barely crossed over, and it became a little less crazy to read. So they they have a bar just barely crossed them over. Now, what every student really wants to know about when it really comes down to it, once they figure out the basics of character or uh, paragraph formatting, the basics are, you know, indented a little bit and um, put some space between them. You know, those are the basics. But you guys want to know how to put them in shapes. So let's say I have this funky shape. I'm going to draw a shape. Now, I don't expect you to draw funky shapes. But let's say I'm drawing a horse, okay? I'll hit the W key so you can see it. Now I'm using the pen tool, which is not an easy tool to use. It's not like, it's not intuitive. Okay, so I will make this look easier than it is. So please forgive me. All right, so I'm drawing this horse. Oh, it's gotta have a nice mane. Ooh, look, nice mane, I'm a nice horse. Okay, there's its mane blowing in the wind. And this will be an ugly drawing, I will warn you. Here's its ear. This is going to be more like, looking more like a dragon than a horse, I would imagine. Here's its face. Gosh, you're a pretty, you're a pretty one there, horse. Here's its uh, body, and let's say he's running. Give him a little hoof there. Wee! Oh boy, this looks really great. Best horse ever. You guys can, you know, tell all your friends later. This is the award-winning stuff right here. And he's got some back hooves. We'll just make him standing still because it makes no sense. Yeah, well, I guess that is, yeah, considering the tool I'm using, I, yeah, this is not the easiest tool to use. Uh, though I do can do it much better than this. Okay, we'll put one leg back there just because I'm in a hurry, and let's give him, you know, some just beautiful tail. Bleed, bleed, oops. La, da, 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 da. Okay, horse. You say, I want my type to go inside of that shape, and I'm like, good luck to you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of different shapes. Simple shapes and complex shapes. This is a complex shape, and it's not symmetrical. So we need symmetrical or uncomplicated shapes. So let me draw a not-so-complicated shape. If I choose the rectangle tool and I click and I hold on it, you will see you have polygons and ellipses. Okay, you have options here. The polygon tool is the one that looks like a stop sign in a way. Now if I click and drag from the center, uh, if I click and start holding down the op uh, option or alt key, it'll draw from the center out. So 
Option key from center out. If I hold down the sh shift key at the same time, it'll draw it perfectly in proportion. Okay? So alter option draws from the center out, and shift keeps it in perfect proportion. There's that. Maybe you want a triangle. Well, where's the triangle tool? Well, there's rectangle, ellipse, and polygon. There's no triangle. If I double click on the polygon tool, however, it will give me options for settings, and I can put as many sides on this as I want. How many sides does a triangle have? Three. Okay. I click, oops, I click and drag. Oh, I have a triangle now. So the polygon tool takes care of uh, items that have multiple sides, such as triangles, stars, things like that. Oh, what if you wanted a star? I don't see a star tool. Well, no, if I double click on the polygon tool, though, if I want five points to the star, I can have a star inset. Um, I don't know, 10, 20%, I don't know. I hit OK, and now if I draw, it will draw a star. Oh, how just freaking wonderful that is. So many people don't realize that the polygon tool takes care of shapes other than these basic, you know, hex hexagonal, octagonal, and all that. You can do stars. You can do um, multiple points. What if something's on sale and you want it to be like a little, you know, a little star for a sale? We'll double click on the tool and make it 20 point star with a 50, uh, let's, well, no, let's do a 30% star inset. And oh, because I had that item selected, it applied it to that item. So you can select an item. So it turned it into a little, oh look, sale. If the item is selected and you double click on the polygon tool, it will do whatever you tell it to. So if I say 20 and 30, or 50 and 20, it will apply it to whatever it is that you drew. Okay, otherwise it won't and you just draw something new. So we have these shapes. Now, of course, there's, an, there's the uh, ellipse tool. That's to create circles and ovals. Uh, to create a circle, you would just hold down the shift key and start dragging. If you hold down the alt key, it'll do it from the center out while you're holding down the shift key. <coughs> if you want to do an oval, you just hold down the alt key and just start drawing from the center out any oval you want. And then lastly would be the rectangle tool, which takes care of squares and rectangles. Not much in, anything exciting there. Okay, so we're doing more unconventional shapes. Now let's talk about each of these shapes and, and what happens when we try to put text in them. So we have this horse. Let me make him smaller to go with the other guys. Now to make him hold, smaller, I'm holding down Shift and Command, and I click and drag. This is with the uh, selection tool. Uh, excuse me. There we go. Shift and Command, and it, it resizes him in proportion that I drew him. Right, I keep having problems with my mouse, and uh, let me just start clicking and dragging, then hold down and shift and command. There we go. It's hard to grab. There we go. So, I am going to put type inside of this horse because I am really cool. So, I'm going to grab my type tool. I'm going to click in here. And I even like clicked up here around his hind quarters, it put my cursor way over here at the topmost point of the horse. You don't have a choice. It puts it at the topmost point. Now if I go to File and Place, or I could copy and paste the text, but go to go File and Place and I open it, you make this text much smaller in proportion to the horse. I'll make it even smaller. And what happens here is Let's say I wanted to take the stroke off of this too. I didn't want this to show, and I wanted just the type to look like it's in the shape of a horse. I'm going to select all this. I'm also going to justify it. Usually with us, when type is in a shape, I justify the copy so it'll push it right to the edges of the shape. Now, if I hit the W key, does that at all look like a horse? Maybe somewhat, but if you guys weren't here to see the demonstration and I asked somebody, does this, what's this look like? They would say, it looks like a mess. And then I'd say, okay, average person who didn't know I was doing this, where would you start reading? And they'd say right here at TIV, because it's the top most left area, because here in the United States we start at left, top, and we start reading from there. Also, 
what happens too is when it starts breaking things down into its legs and stuff, we would read this leg as merely 17 or 170,000 chimpanzees in Africa and Poption in rapid one re. Oh, this makes no sense whatsoever. What InDesign does it is it skips across the span and you cannot expect the reader to skip across. They don't know. Even if I put the stroke on here, they would not know to read here and then skip over to there. They don't know. So a complicated shape like this is actually not your best kind of shape because it's asymmetrical and there's literally places the text has to jump from one place to another. Okay. Now, if I wanted this to be in the shape of a horse, then I have to deal with something more symmetrical. Like if I were looking at a horse in the front shape of its head, that might work because it's perfect symmetry. Or an hourglass has perfect symmetry. Yes, yes. So she's saying, hey, can you make the text go along the path of the horse so then we know that it just is the shape of the horse? And yes, you can. So let's talk about that. I'm going to get rid of all the text in there because that's not making a whole lot of sense there. If I hold down the type tool in the tools panel and I click and I hold, it'll pop up to where you have a couple of options. You have type tool and type on path tool. Oh, it's got type and it's got a little line underneath. It's a squiggly, a little T. Now, my cursor also became squiggly when I got to that tool. And now, in theory, we'll see if it works in practice. If I, let me move him so we can see the whole horse here. Let's say I wanted people to read back here at his rear end. If I wait and hover over with my type tool, type on path tool, you'll see a little plus sign pops up. Plus sign means it's okay to click now. So if I click there, you'll see that the type, I can type anything along there, okay? Or I could go to File and Place, or Copy and Paste if I'm doing that. I could go to File and Place, and I could go get text that way. Usually in something like this, I will copy and paste. Can you pull it again? Sure. Let me step back. So if I wanted to, hit Command-Z a few times here. If I wanted to draw a shape, and it could be a complex shape or a simple shape. In this case, now I will tell you some of the problems with complex shape here in just a second. So I have this shape selected. I click on the type tool and I hold down on my mouse till I get this flyout menu that comes up. And I use the, I can see that there's a type on path tool. Keyboard shortcut is shift T if you're in the keyboard shortcuts. I hover my cursor over the path at the beginning point and that I want people to read. And when I get the plus sign, I click and you'll see the cursor is blinking on that path. Now I'm going to go to File and Place and I'm going to get my text. Now unfortunately I have the first line which is just the word chimpanzees. So I'm highlighting that word chimpanzees and I'm deleting it. Okay, there's all the type all around there. Now it is a hot mess because it's a complicated shape and when you have really sharp turns like this this is a problem. Now I'm going to make this much smaller type because it's just too big for that horse. The smaller the type, uh, the better off it is. However, we still have problems like this. Okay. Now I'm going to actually turn off the stroke here. Click on the little stroke icon and hit none. Because you really want the type to be the thing that's creating the outline. So this works somewhat well, but when we get to places where the, there's a sharp angle, it's not so well. So in this case, sometimes I will put my cursor uh, before between words. I'll hit the space bar until I can get it to cooperate. And now this, this is a, like, it's just a little, and then, and then this between M and O, or between O and N, if I hit the space bar, it might work. If it doesn't work with spacebar, we have to find other, other things. Oh my, like wonderf wonderful, I think it is. I don't know what the heck. 
you know, that's going to be really hard for me to deal with because it's broken that word. So you really think shapes like this can get a little funky. <coughs> I tend to go with simple shapes when I'm doing this because I end up spending more time trying to clean this thing up than what it's worth. Now, a simple shape such as this out here that does not have extreme angles. Now, the little Stark things, those will not wrap well. But as soon as I get my type on path and I click on that path, I can place the text. Okay, so I'm going to go to place it. Command, Command D, which is file place, get the text, hit open. Again, this paragraph, it's, it's, it's the headline, so I'm going to delete that. I had to use the arrow key to arrow over to the next thing. And so now we have all this type. Let me make it smaller. This type is wrapping around that shape. But I always turn off the stroke on the shape by clicking on the stroke button, which is the, it looks like a square donut. Make sure you click on that so it's in the front. Usually the fill is in the front. So I click on the square donut and say none. That's the none symbol. And then the type makes up the shape. So you could get more experimentive with shapes. Um, in the example in the book, they show it as type inside of shapes versus type going on the outside of them. So let's go to the circle for just a second, and I'll show you how much better. Let me move these, and I'm going to make this circle just a little bit bigger. Get these out of here. I'll show you how. Um, this works. I just made that bigger by holding down shift to command and I clicked and dragged and it made it bigger. Okay, so for this one it's not type on a path. We don't want to go on the outside of this. We just need the regular type tool. And if I click inside of this circle, let me go get the type. Get rid of the headline in this case. And it starts it at, uh, you know, this looks not too bad because it's a uh, symmetrical shape. I do want to kill the hyphens in this. Oh, it is already, oh, there we go. Now, when I tell this to get rid of the stroke, I don't normally keep strokes on when something, I'm doing something like this. So again, I click on the square shape with, looks like a little square donut. I say no, no, no stroke, please. But then the right side of this is ragged, so it's a flush left, ragged right. Anytime I do type inside of a shape, I do justified because it puts it both flush left and flush right, and it looks so much better than not justifying it. So if you guys are creating some shapes and you want the type to kind of contour to that shape, make sure that that type is set justified. Okay? So let me show you the difference between those two. This one is a justified setting, and that's the flush left, rag right setting. The one on the left looks better. You could do any shape. I would, I would suggest uh, symmetrical shapes. Now, in the book, they do have a situation. Now, this is funky. Um, it's on the page, it's on page 113 in the upper uh, right hand corner. They have it so that they've put space between the paragraphs and they have the ending line kind of trailing off. So let me put spaces between the paragraphs real quick. This would be for me a space after the paragraph of same thing as letting roughly. Oops, I put 14 pikas instead of 14 points. There we go really put it in there wide. And they have these paragraphs just kind of trailing off. Oh, they worked really hard on that. Let me tell you, that's not an easy thing. That is not an easy thing. Try to get something to trail off here. Okay. So how did they do that? Well, they this this gets really complicated. They drew a line. They could use you could use the uh, the uh, pencil tool for this. But they're like, okay, I want it to trail from this point on. So they're going to draw, they drew a little trail line like so. <laughs> now, they eventually took off the stroke on this, but I'm going to leave it on for a moment. For a moment. 
Uh, if you wanted to, you could even alter the line by using the white arrow tool, known as the direct selection tool. Some people call it the move tool. This is now called the, what are they calling it this time? Uh, usually it's direct slash selection. Uh, okay, I'm floating over and it's not telling me. So, oh, direct selection tool. Sometimes they change the names from one version to another. And what we want to do is we want this last line. For mine, it's the chip population there had decreased 90%. We want that to go along here. Well, first thing I need to do is get the type on path tool and turn this path into uh, a, a type path. So I just clicked on it. Now it's a type path. Now, what I guess I would do next is I would close this up so I would squeeze out everything but the last, including the last line of that phrase. I'm going to hit the plus sign. I'm going to link it to that line. And I'm going to turn that line so the stroke has nothing. So this is really complicated. It looks simple, but it's not. Now what I have to do is when I get to the end of that paragraph, assuming that line is long enough, I click on the plus sign and I draw another box for the next paragraph and so on. Now my line was not quite long enough for that. I'm going to hit the W key so we can see that my line needed to hold on to, it needed to have 20 years on there too. So I may have to grab it with a white arrow tool and stretch that line out a little bit. Assuming I can even get that anchor point. Okay, let's move him and get that anchor point. There we go. And now I have the 20 years on there. So that thing that they're showing on the book, in the book, that has type trailing off like this, it is not as easy as it might seem. <laughs> okay? It's doable, but it's not as easy as it might seem. Now, the last... The rest of them, it looks like, you know, we've already covered uh, kind of what they've done, or it's so simple that we don't need to really talk about it. But there's one on page 112. It's the bigger one. It shows each paragraph as a spiral, which is very, very fun. However, there is no spiral tool here in um, InDesign. There's a line tool. There's a pencil tool. There's no spiral tool in here. So you can't get a spiral in InDesign. So in this case, I actually, I know what can make a spiral really nicely. It's Illustrator. So for spirals, I have to open up Illustrator, create a spiral, and bring it over to InDesign. Now, Illustrator and InDesign are kind of like friends. They're both vector-based software. They're not made with, they don't, they don't, they don't create pixel stuff. They, they're vector. They're mathematics, shapes. So if I create a shape in Illustrator, I can copy and paste it from Illustrator to InDesign, and it will come in, not as a picture, but as a shape and I can work with it. So I might create a spiral in Illustrator. If I want a spiral, I, I, that's where I would create it. I can't create it in InDesign, not easily, not accurately. So I'm opening Illustrator. Yeah, you could create a spiral in InDesign, but you can use the pen tool and it's, uh, it's, it's much more difficult than you, it, it's, it's pretty difficult. So I'm like, I'm all about making things simple. So Illustrator's taking time to open. Um, basically, uh, right now, I've been kind of messing around. You know, I only have this one that technically follows along with the assignment. This is all exploration here with all sorts of things going on everywhere. So this is this second panel is not done yet because I'm just trying to play with all sorts of things as, as a demo. But I would have five different ways of doing this, all of them looking completely different from one another, and preferably uh, not the same as what they have in the book. Now, I'm going to Illustrator. I'm going to create a new document. I really don't care too much what size it is. Uh, letter's fine, because I'm just going to draw something on there and use it in, 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 uh, in design. Illustrator does have a spiral tool. It is found under the line segment tool, which is just a little line. I click and I hold, and you'll see a spiral tool. There's all sorts of other tools, but right now, spiral tool is what I want. I can click and drag, and I get a spiral. Ooh, it's so pretty. And I can, you know, big size, little size, whatever. <coughs> the only problem is, is it may not have as many segments as you need it to. Okay? So, to get segments, 
I can hit the, while I'm dragging, a, whoa, that, that's too few segments there. While I'm dragging or drawing with it, I can hit the, uh, on the keyboard, there's an up arrow, down arrow, left arrow, and right arrow. If I hit the up arrow while I have the mouse clicked down, and every time I hit the up arrow, it adds a segment, okay? When you hit the down arrow, it takes away segments. This is Illustrator, not InDesign. Okay. Now, um, let's say it's not quite big enough. You can hold down the Shift key and keep... I've, I have never let off the mouse, by the way. I've had the mouse down the whole time. If I hold down the Shift key, you'll notice that when I make it smaller, the number of segments goes down a little bit. Now, I not only have the shift key held down, I have the, uh, it's not just shift, it's shift and alt or shift or option. So option key, well, there we go. It's a little funky, but it can add segments as you get larger. Okay. Now there is a way to tighten up the spiral. I've got to remember how to do that. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Yay, I'm tightening up the spiral. This is like learning a piano key on a keyboard. To tighten up the spiral, and it will automatically, it won't automatically add segments, so you may have to add segments in a minute, but it's shift and command, and if you click and drag out, it reduces the number of spirals, or the, the, the space between the spirals. If you squeeze in, it will make the spirals closer to one another. Okay, that's a lot to cover for just one tool. Okay, your default you get is something that looks more like this spiral. And this is after I played with it and gave it more segments and tightened it up. I know it's crazy. And then once I start this, I try to undo what I'm like I, I try to get back to the default. Let me let me try to get back to the default because this is always a little difficult for me here. Oops, spiral tool, please. Okay, let me take down the number of spirals real quick. I'm trying to make it try to make it look like the de default. Okay, the default looks kind of like this. Okay, so I wanted to get back to the beginning. Default. As I as I'm drawing, hold down the command key and shift. Make you a pretty big one. First, make a big one. Then hold down shift and command, and as you squeeze in, you'll get it closer together. Okay. Let off shift and command and hit the arrow up key to add segments. Arrow down key to take them away. Okay? It's quite tricky. I had to open up Illustrator because InDesign doesn't have a spiral tool. Oh, Illustrator. Uh, it's underneath the line segment tool. If I click on the thing that's a little diagonal line, I hold you'll see a spiral tool. <laughs> Again, I'm going to walk through this one more time and I'm going to go very slowly. Okay, If I just click and drag, and I still have my mouse held down, by the way, I've, I've not let my mouse off, I make a fairly large spiral by clicking and dragging. To, again, my mouse is still depressed. Now I'm going to hold down Shift and Command and I'm going to squeeze in. Again, my mouse is still depressed. I'm going to make this a little smaller. As I make it smaller, it increases the number, or it, it uh, decreases the amount of space between the rings and makes uh, more of them. Now, I still have my mouse depressed. I'm going to let off Shift and Command, and I'm going to hold down, I'm going to use the arrow up key to add spir arcs in the spiral, or my arrow down key to take away arcs in the spiral. Whew! That's a lot of work, isn't it? For those of you guys who are wanting to do the spiral stuff. Say again. Uh, the on the keyboard on that we have this is would not be on your uh, laptop, but on a regular keyboard we have four arrow keys between the number keyboard and the letters keyboard. That's the arrow up and down key. If you're on a laptop, um, gosh. You might have to, I would probably have to Google how to do that on a laptop to see which keys to use if you don't have the arrow keys. There's always a way. Now, once I like the spiral, I don't know if it's big enough or not, but I'm going to take it, I'm going to take, I'm going to bring it over to InDesign. So I go to edit and copy because 
InDesign and Illustrator are buddies. They're both vector. This should come in as a, an editable spiral, even though we don't have a spiral tool in InDesign. And let me get to another page. Now I'm going to go to Edit and Paste. Hello, there he is. How do I know if it's editable? Well, if I click on the white arrow tool, you should be able to see that these nodes can be clicked on and moved, okay? So I just clicked on, I'm clicking on each mode individually and moving each um, node individually and moving it. I'm just going to hit Command Z to undo that. Okay, now I'm ready to put type on this. Before I put type on it, I'm probably going to rotate it so that I can get the uh, first arc to be kind of in the upper left because we tend to read from left to right. So I put the beginning of the spiral at the upper left. And I, to rotate it, you just click on it and then with the black arrow tool, float around the edge of a corner and you'll turn into two little arrows. When you see those two little arrows, click and drag and you'll see that it will rotate. If we click on it, it opens the page and we can see. You're clicking on it and it's opening a page? Um, yeah, we can see how many segments we want. Oh, you mean in Illustrator? Yes. So you're saying if you double click on this or um, click I, I, click I, on, I, the, on the. Yeah, 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 yeah yes, thank you, uh, Sepida. Uh, Sepida is going, boy, these keyboard shortcuts are really hard to remember. She says, why can't you just click on the spiral tool, then click, this is an illustrator by the way, click on the artboard and type how big you want it, what decay you want, and how many segments, and do you want it spiraling from the left to the right or right to the left? So if I say I want the radius to be 300, it's going to be, whoops, not 3,000, it's going to be twice the size of this. Decay is the percentage, I believe, of how dif the distance between the um, arcs. Segments, since it's bigger, I'm going to have, let's say, 30 segments. Unfortunately, there is no preview here. I hit OK, and there we go. I just created a spiral twice the size of this. So you do have some control over this by clicking on the spiral tool and clicking on the white. <coughs> I wish this had a preview button. This would be very useful. I'll email Adobe tonight. <laughs> Let them know. Okay, so that's a little bit easier than having to use your uh, all your keyboard shortcuts that I've taught you. You can tell that I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts because they're faster for me, but uh, if you want to use that, that's fine. So we pasted it into InDesign. We copied it from Illustrator, pasted it here. And now I want to put type on here. So I'm going to, this will be type on a path. It needs to go along that spiral. So I need to hold down the type tool and get type on path tool. And then I'll click at the very beginning of that segment. And you can see if I start typing, it goes in there. But this is actual specific text. So I'm going to have to copy and paste it from my text, uh, text box from a previous uh, page or, or even file place. But let's say I just wanted this one paragraph. This is where you would probably do, use copy and paste versus linking them up. Because uh, if you try to link these up, it's going to be a big pain in the rear, rear end. Now I've pasted it. And you always want to turn off the underline because it looks really bad for the type to be cut by this line. It's just kind of invading its space. So make sure you turn off the stroke. So say stroke of none. And that looks so much better. I can still click on there and select all the type and make it smaller or bigger or whatever. Maybe I want this to be 10 point type. But you, you do have to pay attention and realize that maybe the spiral you created wasn't big enough to hold the entire paragraph that you have. If that's the case, make sure the entire paragraph is in there. If I'm grading your stuff and I see that this stopped mid paragraph, you know, mid sentence like this, I know that you did a fabulous job at creating a, a spiral and putting text on it, but then I also know that you didn't put that all the text didn't fit on there. So I will then know that you needed to create a spiral with more rings or a bigger spiral. So this is a little bit of a trial and error here because you're going from InDesign to Illustrator and you don't know exactly how big your spiral is and you can't add segments here in InDesign. So it's 
This one's probably a pretty tough thing, but everybody sees it and wants to know how it was done. So I want to make sure everybody knows how it was done in case you wanted to challenge yourself with it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, when I do my copy and paste, it only does like four. Mm. Dom's got a problem that only part of the, uh, possibly part of this came in. If he had the white arrow tool selected, and somehow this is, I'm going to just theorize. Maybe he clicked and dragged over this to select it, but it only grabbed part of the anchor points instead of all of them. So I go to edit and copy. And when I go to InDesign, when I paste it, edit and paste, it's only going to paste the segments that were selected. So if you have something that happens like this, oops, that means you needed to make sure you chose that spiral with the black arrow tool, not the white arrow tool. The white arrow tool deals with parts and pieces, and the black arrow tool deals with whole things. I know it wasn't quite probably like this, Dom, but something similar. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do for the rest of the time, um, I think I've covered almost anything you see in the book that I, you know, there's some things in there that you could play around with. It's just a matter of changing the point size and the leading and making it thicker. I think you can handle stuff like that. Uh, it's just, that's that's not so hard. Um, but is there anything else that you're seeing? You're going, oh, how would you do this? Or you're dreaming it up. How would you do this? It sounds, you know, I want to do something like this, and it's really cool, but I don't know how to come about it. If you can't think of a an answer to that question, or if you can't think of a question about that now, certainly during class time, as I'm walking around, I can help you guys tackle some of these things. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now, assuming we have no more questions, and get that ready. And we can take a break also.